the true purpose of life. What do you think we are here for? Is it just a matter of being born, going through puberty, falling in love, getting married, having children, then working until retirement, then being pushed into a retirement home or village, dying, and that's all? Is that what life, what life is? Is it what people claim it to be, going through the education system of this world, doing your undergrad, your master's, and PhD, and becoming a professor? Do we call that a purpose? So that those who are not PhD holders have failed in their work as human beings. And those who have not done any education are just useless. They don't exist. They have not done anything to do with their purpose for existence. What really is the purpose of life? Is it to make people angry, to hurt everyone across your path, so that every tear that falls because of your habit makes you feel like I have achieved it? When your wife is crying and sobbing because of your habit, you feel like, yes, I am fulfilling my purpose. What really is the purpose for humanity? And listen, you don't have to agree with me today. But when it comes to the word of God, I think it is safest for you and I to believe only that which the word of God says. That is the safest place for you and I in this time in which deception is becoming profitable. Deception is becoming fashionable. Our only hope is to build our trust in thus saith the Lord principle, and that's all we're going to do. So we don't have to keep you as friends as long as we tell you the truth. If we keep you as friends, glory to God. But if because of the truth you consider us your enemies, then glory to God too. And I hope that doesn't come out as arrogant because I want you to be saved as much as I want to be saved myself. And if I came here and told you my words, I am failing as a mission, as a missionary worker. I am failing as a descendant of Abraham. I am failing as a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, do you want to learn the Bible and what the Bible says about our purpose? And I hope by the end of it all, we will remain what? Friends. Thank you so much. Genesis chapter 1, a verse that all of us know very well. Chapter 1, let's read together. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And verse 27, so God created man in his own image. The Bible says, in the image of God, he created he, him. Male and female created he, them. Now, seriously, if we wanted to know the purpose of humanity, the reason we were created, do we go to media? Do we go to the educational institutions of this world? Where would be the best place to go and ask this question, why do I exist? The creator. He is the only person who knows why he created us. He is the only person who can give 100%, in fact, 110% correct answer as far as why George is here today, why you are here today, no one else. Not even your choices, not even your talents, not even your hobbies decide why you are on earth today. Only God knows why he created us, and so we will ask him. Isaiah 43, verse 7. Isaiah 43, verse 7. And if you're there, please let me know by saying amen. One brother is there. I'll wait for sisters and brothers. Which book did I say? Isaiah 43, the seventh verse. Let's read this slowly together, if you don't mind. Are you there? Isaiah 43, verse 7. If you're ready, let's go. Even... Everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my what? Glory. I have formed him. Yeah, I have made him. So the creator tells us, listen, I don't care what someone else has taught you or what you've learned from my experience on earth. The reason I created you is for my what? Glory. No wonder the prophet told us these words. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy seraphs to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God, darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man could no longer reveal the glory of the divine. We have just read in the book of Isaiah 43 verse 7 that the main reason why God brought us to this earth, the main reason he made us part of the history of the universe is that we may give him glory. 
But because of sin, the Bible tells us that the heart was so defiled and it could not reveal the glory of God. In other words, because of sin, we could not fulfill the purpose for which we were created. Mm. If that makes sense, please say amen. amen. And that's all you've been learning here. It says, but by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. This is the good news, brothers and sisters, that God can bring us back to where it all started, that our journey to, back to Eden is made possible by the provision of Christ, in summary, by the incarnation of Christ Jesus. It took God to come down in human flesh to undo what the devil had done. Because of that, the very first step out of Eden was also, I mean, the last step out of that garden was also the first step back to that garden. And this is wonderful. It is because of the incarnation of Christ that we have books such as Revelation 14, verse 6. Let's go there. And it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. And what was the message? Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains therein, and fountains of waters. Listen, this mission is only possible because of the incarnation of Christ. This mission is only possible because Christ restored that which the devil had taken away. If you're with me, please say amen. Now let's go to another book that also tells us something that happened because of this incarnation. Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah 60. The book of Isaiah, the 60th chapter, we read verse 1 to 3. Arise and shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Arise and shine, for thy light has come. And notice, the glory of the Lord has risen upon whom? Thee. And then it says in verse 2, brothers and sisters, Darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall rise in thee, and his glory shall be seen in thee. If, if you notice, I'm not an Englishman, but you notice that I'm trying to emphasize some words. Like sin in you. Is that emphasis? Is that how you emphasize? Sin in you. Whatever the glory of God is, it is perceived by sight. That's what the word S-W-E-N means. Whatever the glory of God that is going to be seen in your life, it is perceived by what? Sight. And that begs a question. What really is the glory of God? That the incarnation of Jesus had made possible to be seen in me. What is the glory of God that the coming of Christ, the death of Christ, his resurrection and his promise to come again has made possible to be seen in my life? What is it? Come with me to the book of Exodus. Exodus 33, verse 17. These are common verses. You're just revising God's word. Exodus 33, 17. It says in my version, and the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And then he says in verse 18, and he, speaking about Moses, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. We've just read in Isaiah that the glory of the Lord will be seen in you. Now, this guy called uh, Moses is asking a question, what is your glory? Now, notice verse 19. And he, speaking about God, he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Even without finishing that specific verse, it is interesting that in answering the question, show me thy glory, God tells him, I will let my goodness pass before you. Already I can see, I don't know whether you can see, that the glory of God has a connotation of the virtue of God. But as if that is not enough, 
Chapter 34, verse 6 gives us a clearer picture of what really, this really means. Chapter 34, verse 6, it says, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. The Lord proclaims his glory. God defines his glory by stating his virtues, goodness, mercy, kindness, judgment, just. The Lord defines explains his glory by giving Moses his character. It is on this basis that the prophet affirms it is his righteous character that constitutes the glory of God. It says, and it is this same glory that Christ's praise may be given to his followers upon earth. It is his righteous character that constitutes the glory of God. And Jesus goes forward and prays for that glory to be given to the children of God. And that includes you and me. In fact, in John 17 verse 22, he says exactly that. The glory which thou gavest unto me, I have given unto them. So in simple terms, what are we trying to say? Based on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, the glory of God is what? I know that's an African way of asking, is what? I should go like, what is the glory of God, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's righteous character. The glory of God represents the character of God. Now, if you're with me, please say amen. amen. Now, I want us to read the book of Isaiah chapter 60 and replace the word glory with the word what? Character. Arise and shine, for thy light is come. And the character of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his character shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. The Bible says, it is only when the character of God is seen upon thee that the Gentiles will come to thy light. And this is really important. We are trying to answer a question, what is the purpose of Christianity? What is the purpose of life? And we found from God's word, God created us for his glory. Up to this point, we have noticed from our short study that the glory of God actually represents his character. So it is God's work and God's hope that he will find people amongst the human race that would cooperate with him and fulfill his purpose of reflecting his character. That is the purpose for our existence. And the devil put a comma on that purpose. And so God sent his only begotten son and ask yourself why Jesus came. The, the prophet answers us very well. She says, Christ came to our world to represent the character of God as it is represented in his law. For his law is a transcript of his character. Christ was both the law and the gospel. Let's finish it together. The followers of Christ are to become like him. By the grace of God to form characters in harmony with the principles of his holy law. And then she says this is Bible sanctification. There is no other sanctification. This is Bible sanctification. And God has brought us into his church that we may help him fulfill his purpose for human race, reflect the character of God, develop the character of Jesus, show the world what manner of God we are serving, show the world what manner of God has called us into his mission by reflecting his character to the people who are watching us. In fact, I want to use the book of Mark chapter 4, a parable, to explain this further. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. Mark 4, 26. My version says, And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, 
and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow, and he knoweth not how. 28. For the earth bringeth forth fruits of herself first, the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. 28. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, it putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Jesus uses a parable of a sower to explain what the kingdom of God is like. He says it is like a sower who casts his seed. When he casts his seed, he goes back home. After a couple of days, he comes back and the seed has sprouted into a seedling and then into a plant. And then it produces the corn and the ear and eventually the fruit. But do you know how the seed grows? How many here are farmers? Any farmers? Do you know how the seed grows? We just put the seed on the ground and go home singing our songs, knowing that that seed will grow. But how it does, we don't know. And that's what Jesus is trying to say here. Two points come into play. One, the sowing process is meant for seed for future planting and fruit in the harvest. That's the two main reasons we do our planting. That you may have seed for future sowing or a future you know, season, but also have fruit from the harvest. At least that's what we do in Africa. And I believe here too. We plant so that we may have seeds, continuity, and apart from that, that we may have fruit or food out of our planting. But the second point is that the seed growing process is a time-bound process. There is a planting, maybe there is a weeding, maybe there is a pruning, and then there is a, you know, and then eventually the harvest. It is a time-bound process. As it is in the physical world, so also in the spiritual. The reason Christ brings this, he was trying to tell them something. The seed is the word of God. The sower is a living preacher. Like me right now, or you when you share with a brother. When you share the word of God, you are planting. But just like a physical farmer, you do not know how the word of God gets to the heart of human mind and changes them to the people they are today. I don't know how the word of God works in your heart to even feel loved with Jesus or by Jesus, who maybe a couple of days ago you never believed he loves you. I don't know how the word of God works in your soul to make the changes that he has made. But my work is to preach. And I preach hanging on the hope that God has given us, hanging on the promises. Isaiah 55 verse 11 is one of them. And it says that my word shall not come to me void. It will fulfill what it went. Let's read that verse. Let me not use my words. Isaiah 55, the 11th verse. Isaiah 55, the 11th verse. I do not know how the seed grows. I do not know how baptism comes about because someone has spoken for a week or two. I do not know how someone decides to go off drinking and smoking and thuggery and, and every sort of evil habits because they have had the word of God. My work is to cast the seed. The growing process is in the hands of God. But I can hang on these promises. 55, 11. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. If the Lord brought us to autumn leaves this year, that he may send a specific message, believe you me, it will fulfill its purpose. That's my hope. That's the promise I hang on. Because I know not how the spirit works. I know not how the word of God works in your heart, but I believe it is not coming back in vain. Psalm 126 verse, Psalm 126 verse, we read verse 5 and 6. The 126 Psalm, 5 and 6. The Bible says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Verse 6, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And so goes the songwriter, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in what? The sheaves. I hang on this even right now as I preach. 
I don't know how this word will work in your heart. I don't know how this word is going to work in your mind. But it is my duty this afternoon to tell you that the purpose for which you exist is to reflect God's character. The purpose for which you are created is that your wife may see Jesus in you. Your husband may see Jesus in you. Your brother may see Jesus in you. Your neighbors may see Jesus in you. And that that process is a time-bound process. That that process is a time-bound process. And God, day by day, year by year, he will shed off that which you need to shed off and develop that which you need to develop to fulfill his purpose. And I do so with confidence in his promises that the seed that I sow will grow. And that the word that he gives will fulfill the purpose for which he gave it. So what really is the reason for the gospel? What is the main reason for Christianity? Why did God give us his word? He gave us the word of God as a seed to grow on the soil of our hearts and bear the fruit which is his character. If that makes sense, please say amen. amen. Let's just strengthen this with what the prophet says because our words is more trust, trustworthy than mine. The object of the Christian life is what? Fruit bearing. And then she defines the fruit. She says, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be produced in others. Let me slow down. If your preaching, my preaching, does not fulfill this purpose, go back to the drawing board. If my knowledge of the end time events, my knowledge of the book of Daniel and Revelation does not create Jesus in me, go back to the drawing board. Because this is the main thing. And listen, I am a prophecy preacher. Seriously, that's my area. But I know for sure from what I've studied from in God's word that that is useless if we are not going in the spirit of Christ. And the only way we can go in the spirit of Christ is to allow Jesus to cooperate with him that the seed of his truth may grow in our hearts and produce the seed of Christ-likeness. <coughs> it is for this purpose that Adam and Eve was created, that the whole world may see Jesus in them. It is for this reason, brothers and sisters, that Israel was chosen as a witness and God told them that you are my witnesses that I am God, Isaiah 42. God called upon them to be witnesses for him. In what way? That he is God. They were supposed to reflect the image of Jesus. Unfortunately, they had all their priorities wrong. And reading the book of Matthew chapter 21, Matthew 21 verse 43, will tell you the end results. You just go to Matthew 21 verse 43. Matthew 2, 1, verse 43. It says, therefore say I unto you. Jesus talking to the Israelites, the Pharisees. He says, therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So did the Israelites bear the fruits? They did not. They had the word, the seed, but it did not grow in their life to bear the fruits. And in God's wisdom, he says, for this reason, we will take the kingdom of God from you and give it to another nation that will be able to cooperate with my providence to bear the fruits. And with those words, the 12 disciples were called as a nucleus of the church that was to go forward to bear the fruit of Jesus. In fact, come with me to chapter 15 of John verse 8. John 15, 8. I refer to this as a term of reference, terms of reference to this new church of God. Terms of reference to these new witnesses. It says in verse 8, herein is my father done what? Glorified that ye bear little fruit. Much, Much fruit. And notice, <laughs> once again I say I'm not an Englishman, but I know a little English. What does much mean? what's the connotation that when you see the word much what does it mean plural or single plural. a lot of things but then he goes like that you bear much fruit in my poor English I thought it would go like much fruits but it is just fruit and we have no time to discuss that there is one specific goal that God has with you and me and that is Christ likeness 
the fruit. And Jesus says that as you bear the fruit of the gospel, as you bear the fruit on the Christian tree, you are glorifying my Father. Herein is my Father glorified. If you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Terms of reference. And so Sister White says something about this group of people. The apostles differed widely in habits and disposition. There were the publican Levi Matthew and the fiery zealot Simon, the uncompromising hater of authority of Rome, the generous impulsive Peter, and the mean-spirited Judas. Thomas, true-hearted yet timid and fearful, Philip, slow of heart and inclined to doubt, and the ambitious outspoken sons of Zebedee, with their brethren. These were brought together with their different faults, all with inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil. But in and through Christ, they were to dwell in the family of God, learning to become one in faith, in doctrine, in spirit. She says, true to God's word, brothers and sisters, Three and a half years later, these people with different characters, the Bible gives testimony about them that they were of one accord. Just three and a half years later, they were of one mind. They were in one accord. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. Verse 46 it says, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Chapter 4, verse 32, same book. Acts 30, chapter 4, verse 32. My version says, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of not the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Three and a half years later, all these different people were in one accord. And speaking about them, brothers and sisters, the prophet says, they were of one accord, of one heart, and of one mind. One soul, rather. Acts chapter 2, she quotes verse 46 and 4, verse 32. Christ filled their thoughts, and the advancement of his kingdom was their aim. In mind and character, they had become like their master. And men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. The disciples were called from different backgrounds, with different characters. We even saw some of them, their characters coming into play during their ministry. We saw Peter cutting the ears of someone. We saw these sons of Zebedee fighting for a position of Jesus, thinking it is an earthly kingdom. But believe you, brothers and sisters, because of their cooperation with God, just three and a half years later, they were of one mind. Same with Jesus. Actually, people saw them and went like, really? No, these guys have been with Jesus. Now, how long have I been with Christ? I was baptized in 1998. Many of you were not born by that time. Of course, you are older than me. How long have I been with Christ? And how long do I need... How more time do I need to just fulfill God's purpose for me? Reflecting his character. How long? Three and a half years later, these people spent time with Jesus and they were of one mind and one accord. Why? Because the center was Jesus. They were as close to each other as much as they were close to the center. That's what Sister White says in Christ's Object Lesson. Their oneness was created by the fact that each one at individual level wanted to be like Christ. You know what that tells me? The division that exists in the remnant church exists because we have a different example, not Jesus. But if all of us decided to fulfill God's purpose for us and did all that he has made possible to make us like him, we will be of one mind, I promise you. And I thank God that that promise still exists because we are not closing this earth's history until the church of God worldwide is of one mind. To finish the work. But it is not a corporate duty. It is an, an individual work. Every, each one of us should look at Jesus. You know, examine yourself. Examine yourself. How much do you look like Jesus in your traits and habits? God has made it possible for us, brothers and sisters. 
But you know this call did not remain. It did not stand. It did not stop at the disciples. This is the same call that God is making unto us. Once again, we go back to our book. Our theme verse, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. We should have now actually memorized this, those who haven't. Revelation 14, verse 6. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That the Lord has called us that we may be his witnesses. And in so doing, call people out of darkness into the marvelous light that he has called us into. So you and I are actually witnesses to bring people back to Jesus. And then he tells us what our mission really is as disciples for Jesus. He says in 14 verse 6, the first angel's message, verse 7, fear God and give glory to him. That's our terms of reference. Fear God and give glory to him. And so our duty as children of God is to fear God and give him what? Glory. But our purpose of existence is that we may reflect the character of whom? Of God. And so what, is it contradictory? Is God calling upon us to reflect his image on one side and then fear him and give him glory on the other side? Or is God really talking about the same thing? Same thing. We learned earlier that the glory of God is actually his character. And so giving God glory is the same, same mission that was given to Adam and Eve. The same mission that was given to the Israelites. The same mission that was given to the disciples of Christ as the nucleus of the church is the same that God gives to the end time church. Give me glory. To give God glory is to reveal his character in our own and thus making known. What do you think about giving God glory? Like, hallelujah, Hosanna, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. These funny things that are creeping into the church, is that giving God glory? Singing and then swinging and then raising our hands and then shouting to the loudest voice that we can manage. Is that giving God glory? It sort of appears to me that the remnant church jumped into second angel's message and into third angel's message and forgot the first angel's message. And the call in the first angel's message is that, listen guys, I have made it possible for you to go out, not just in my name, but in my character, because my name is my character. And if we go out and spread the second angel's message with the character of Jesus, the success that will follow our work is unimaginable. But in most cases, even when we talk amongst ourselves, even when we handle what we call contradictory amongst ourselves, we do not do it with the spirit of Jesus. Why? Because to us, giving God glory means something else. But God's mission doesn't change. This is the same thing that he has called the human race to do since creation to date, giving glory to God. Now listen to this. It is for this reason that the prophet says, character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Because the wrath of God, the day of the Lord is coming, who shall be able to stand? The Lord gives us his power to be like him. And this is the, this is the main work, brothers and sisters. Why do I say so? Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. How do you fare, my brother, my sister? How do you stand before Christ? What does your wife think about you? What does your husband think about you? And I'm just not talking about you. Yesterday I said we are just standing here because God has given us an opportunity. Any one of you can stand here and preach. So I'm not better than you. What does Nazarene think about me? With all the knowledge in the word of God. Has it made me better? Has it given me the character of Jesus even to the slightest amount of possibility or degree? Or do I feel like there's something I still need to work on in cooperation with God? 
And I know, I know, when we get to this area, antennas are up because they think you're talking about perfection, perfection. And so what? If God says, I will make you perfect as your father is perfect, who are you to tell me I'm not going to be perfect? Whatever perfect means to you, I don't know. But whatever it meant in, in God's mind, it is possible because he has made it so. Character building is the greatest work, brothers and sisters. And Jesus is just longing and waiting for people to cooperate with him. That our bad habits may be shared off and that Jesus may make us like him. Be like Jesus. It's my hope. Be like Jesus all day long. Be like Jesus in the throne or even alone. Be like Jesus is my hope. My only hope. Because that is the only person that will touch people like Jesus touches. In a view given to the prophet 27th June 1850, the accompanying angel said these words, Time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? And this is a fair question. Do you reflect the image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth and saw that there would have to be a greater, a getting ready among those who have of late embraced the third angel's message. Say the angel, get ready, get ready, get ready. And then she says, you will have to die a greater death to the world than ye have ever yet died. I saw that there was a great work to do for them and but little time in which to do it. Do you reflect the image of Jesus as you should? Or are you convicted that there's a part of your life that still needs working on? Do you reflect the image of Jesus to your children? Do you reflect the image of Jesus to your family, your church members, your workmates? Those who refer to themselves as your enemy, because we ought not to have enemies anyway. Do you reflect yourself as Jesus to the people you interact with? And knowing where I stand, I feel like I need to put some faith into action. You know why? The faith that works by love and purifies the soul is the only true faith. The faith that does not produce the fruit, that does not reveal the Christ-likeness, is a false faith. What sort of faith are you holding? Is it the true faith that purifies our soul of evil? allows Jesus to dwell within our heart through the indwelling presence of his spirit and change us from within and then play out as his character from without? Or is it the false faith that says believing is enough? It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter the changes I make. Believing is enough. We can never be like Jesus. From what scripts are you reading? Oh, Jesus is God, we cannot be like, did I say we are becoming gods? Did the, the prophet say we will become gods? No, but we must show the character of Christ. We must reveal the character of Jesus. We must produce the fruit and we must do that in faith by the grace of God. You know there is something in your character you need to work on. Listen, don't waste time. Come, let us pray. You know there's something about you that is not Christ-like. And maybe you've been struggling with it and want, God, please help me. Help me fight this. Help me take it off by the power of your Holy Spirit. Our heavenly and everlasting Father, we approach the throne of grace today with the acknowledgement of our nothingness. And that the only reason we can come before you is the truth and fact that Jesus Christ, our brother and friend, is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary interceding for us. We have come because we have yielded to your call in the book of Hebrews that we may draw to thy throne with confidence because we know that in your son Jesus Christ you've given us an opportunity to be one with you. But Lord, we also come acknowledging that our characters to a large extent does not reflect you. That Lord, in the past we have had opportunities to be like you in someone else's life, but we failed because of selfishness. And we just want to ask you to forgive us, dear Lord. And as we leave this campground in the next few days, 
May you let this ring in our mind, Heavenly Lord, that you created us to glorify you and giving you glory means reflecting your character. That you may reflect it to our wives, our husbands, our children, even those that are stubborn, Heavenly Lord. That you may reflect your image to the people we work with, our interactions, our neighbors, Lord God, and even those who refer to themselves as our enemies. Lord, the only reason we are down on our knees asking for this difficult thing for a carnal mind is because you say it is possible. And Lord, we know you don't turn back on your word. We have come, Father, change us. Pour on us your Holy Spirit that you may guide us from within, that you may be our tutor, Heavenly Lord, that you may fulfill that which you planned for us. That Lord, if we were to die today, we may die in confidence that we have fulfilled our purposes in our pilgrimage upon this earth. But if you are to leave, Lord God, until you come a second time, Holy Jesus, that we may be found upon those people who have your name written on their foreheads, Heavenly Lord, that we may see you and go like, this is our Father, our Savior, we have waited for him. Lord, do not allow the devil to take us back. Do not allow, oh God, falsehood that has come from our outside and even that exists within the church to tell us that it is impossible for us to be like you. Because you are truthful and you say it is possible. I submit these sons and daughters of yours in your hands, Heavenly Lord. I'm a human being in need of help just like them. And so may you take us together, Holy Father, and speak to our hearts. May you give us strength to contemplate that which we have studied today and make tangible steps to take advantage of your providence and build our character, engage in the greatest work that you gave unto us. This we ask, believing that you have answered in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.